One thing that science has taught me is uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Welcome to the AZ Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Hamid Chojai, a tech enthusiast and entrepreneur. Recently, my wife and I sold our software companies and we're investing $10 million in Arizona's tech ecosystem. As a way to know what's happening in Arizona, every week I get to sit down with some exceptionally talented people who are doing some cool shit. All right, let's go. All right, I'm um, here with Dr. Grant McFadden. Um, did I say the McFadden? You said it right. Okay, perfect. An ASU professor and director of the Bioscience Center for Immunotherapy, Vaccines, and Virotherapy. Um, hi, uh, Dr. McFadden. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, you're doing some pretty amazing research. Some of it is showing promise for uh, some curing some types of cancer. So I want to start with your research at ASU, and then uh, we're going to get into all kinds of different topics, including COVID-19 and um, vaccinations in general and your thoughts about all of, all of that stuff. But first, let's start with your research. So can you give us a little background about what kind of stuff you've been researching and, and why and go from there? Sure. Um, so I'm a virologist. So my big professional passion in life is studying viruses, biological viruses. Okay. I've always been fascinated with how they work, what they are, uh, whether or not they're alive or not, uh, and all kinds of fascinating questions. I've been studying uh, this particular virus that my lab works on now. Uh, which is a rabbit-specific virus, for about 30 years. And it's still an amazement to me uh, what it is, uh, how it operates, and what it can do. Um, when you say, like, uh, you, you're studying whether or not they're alive, what do you mean by that? So uh, the, the question of whether or not viruses are alive is actually a little bit philosophical, uh, m much more than scientific. Um, some people consider them alive and some people not. And it's kind of the gray area between uh, the organic life and inorganic. Um, in some ways, um, you can think of viruses as when they are inside of cells as being alive, uh, in that they take over the machinery of a cell and then use it to make more copies of themselves. Okay. But when they're outside of a cell, they're kind of just in an inert uh, a, a collection of protein and nucleic acid and sometimes membrane. And uh, outside the cell, they don't look very alive at all. This totally comes to the sort of philosophical question of like, what are we? Are we a collection of those proteins? And, you know, or are we like able to make decisions on our own? Or are the proteins making the decisions for us, essentially, because of the chemicals that are in the sequences that they are, right? Well, you could even say, uh, what are we made of? Uh, because something like five to ten times the number of cells in our body are bacterial, not us. Oh, uh, wow, yeah. So you can even uh, argue our own bodies, are they really us? Yeah, how much of it is us versus uh, right. you know, bacteria that, that we need, actually, to yes, digest for food or whatever. Um, okay, so let's talk about the uh, virus that you are studying and have been for thir 30 years, you said? Yes. This is, this, okay, this is, that's a long time to study one virus. So give us the background on that. So uh, I did my... Uh, uh, PhD in viruses uh, that infect bacteriophage. And I got kind of fascinated in what they are and, and what they are all about. And when I did my postdoc, I ended up doing it on a virus that is the vaccine strain for a disease called smallpox. Um, most people don't even know about smallpox anymore because it was eradicated from the world by the worldwide vaccination program. And uh, after studying that for a couple of years, I got my own job as an independent investigator uh, when, uh, at the time I was in Canada, and I went looking around for a virus to study of that family. And I ended up picking uh, this particular virus, it's called Myxoma virus, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, it had very curious biology. It was trapped in rabbits, in European rabbits, it couldn't get out of them, and yet it was an extreme pathogen. It kills 99.9% .9 of rabbits that get this virus. Wow. And in fact, in the 1950s, the Australian government imported this virus to try and get rid of wild European rabbits that had run across the, 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 the landscape in Australia. And so they spent several years uh, um, uh, testing and then finally releasing this virus into the wild to see what would happen. To try to control the rabbit population. Correct. I remember actually uh, reading about rabbit population problem in Australia at some point, uh, and, and I thought they 
still, you know, well into the 90s or something had a rabbit uh, population problem. Is that is that right? So okay. so what what happened? Uh, and actually, a book was written about this. A book by Frank Fenner called Myxomatosis, where he described exactly what happened when when they did this trial. Uh, at the time, there were about a billion rabbits hopping around in Holy Australia. God. It was like a plague. <laughs> if you talk to uh, Australian farmers, uh, they didn't regard rabbits as uh, cute little furry pets. They regarded them as like rats with a gland problem. Um, wow. And so it became actually very difficult to engage in farming and agriculture in Australia. And so the Australian government went looking for ways to control the rabbit population. And they tried all kinds of things, and nothing really worked until eventually they got the idea of getting into biological warfare. And they went looking for wow. a microbial pathogen that would infect and kill rabbits, but nothing else. And that's where they found this virus in the literature <coughs> uh, and uh, imported it to Australia, tested it on all kinds of uh, species to make sure it was harmless, uh, including the three lead investigators injected themselves with a live virus to prove it was not a human danger, it was not a human pathogen, and it wasn't. And eventually they got permission to release it into the wilds of Australia. What year is this? So this is about 1950, 1951. There were wow. a number, number of releases that, is it, that is happened. It like the first known use of like... Uh, Warfare, like bio biological wa warfare, essentially? It was the first time a virus was used to try and control a vertebrate pest. Okay. So uh, uh, pathogens have been used uh, uh, during warfare uh, for a long time. In fact, smallpox was used as a warfare agent against indigenous oh, that's uh, right. uh, um, Indians. Uh, I should during... have been paying more attention in history class. To... <laughs> That's true. Yes. I, I, not, not, that refreshes my memory. For yeah. Sure. So myxoma and smallpox are in the same family, but they're very, very different. So smallpox is trapped in humans, which is why we were able to eradicate it. There's no uh, animal reservoir for it. Whereas myxoma virus is trapped in rabbits. And I became very interested, number one, in the biology. Uh, why was it such an extreme pathogen of rabbits and nothing else? And then uh, uh, as I started studying it, I became interested in how a virus chooses one cell over another to infect. It's what we call tropism. And I'm very, very fascinated by the choices viruses can and do make in deciding what cells to infect and what cells not to infect. Wow. So, um, so what happened in this experiment in Australia? So what happened is after a couple of years, the rabbit populations plummeted and they thought they had uh, the war against rabbits won. But uh, within a relatively short period of time, within less than a decade, um, re rabbit resistant uh, uh, strains developed that were much less susceptible to the killing effects of the virus. The virus still infected them, still made them sick, but didn't kill them with 99.9% .9 efficiency anymore. It killed them with about 50% efficiency. Oh, so wow. eventually what happened is not only did the rabbits change genetically, but the virus changed genetically as well. The two uh, went into a dialogue, almost like a, a pas de deux between a virus and a, a vertebrate host species, where each genetically changed in response to each other. We call it coevolution, and we actually can see it in real time happening, the evolutionary changes in the virus and evolutionary changes in the rabbit population. So now, you fast forward to today, there are fewer rabbits around. It is now, once again, a problem, but not as many are as around as there were in 1950. But huh. this virus is now scattered through the rabbit population. It's what we call an enzootic infection uh, in the rabbits in Australia. And it's actually not only in Australia now, it's also in Britain, New Zealand, France, Spain, many other countries. The virus is actually spread around the world, but in exclusively in rabbit populations. How interesting. So you started studying this particular virus. What was your interest in it? So I was interested in, uh, number one, uh, uh, why was the virus trapped in rabbits? Because one of the things we knew at the time is in the lab, you could take this virus and infect cells from species other than rabbits. So in nature, the virus is trapped in rabbits, but in tissue culture, what we say in the lab, on mammalian cells that, that are in a dish in the lab, the virus can infect uh, uh, cells from other species, including monkeys, man, mice, et cetera. Huh. 
And I was kind of fascinated by why is that? Why is the virus eliminated from anything but a rabbit? But in tissue culture, it's much more pers promiscuous. Why is that? And so I spent years trying to understand that, that question. And, and what did you find out? So it turns out uh, the answer is full of fascinating little uh, tidbits. So it turns out that the reason the virus does not survive in mice or humans, it's because the immune system of mice and humans recognizes the virus as foreign and gets rid of it. And the virus has no way to stop the, the, the vertebrate host from getting rid of it. Oh, I see. However, in rabbits, rabbits have an immune system as well. But this virus has co-evolved with rabbits. Uh, actually, it co-evolved with a different genus of rabbits in South America uh, over tens of millions of years. And so during that time, during that time of evolution, the virus had learned tricks of how to avoid the immune system of the infected animal. And so it picked up a collection of genes that allowed it, that gave it the property of being able to subvert the immune system in rabbits. So what that means is that if you put this virus into a rabbit, the rabbit's immune system will try and get rid of it, but the virus has all of these tools, these genetic tools, that function in a way to combat the immune system. So it pretends like it's a rabbit cell rather than a non, or a, a, a attacker. So it, it's actually even more. It, it, it doesn't pretend to be anything. It actually makes molecules that go forth and interact with the molecules of the, the rabbit immune system. So in other words, you can kind of think of it as many of the molecules get released from the virus-infected cells and go forth and do battle with the elements of the immune system. Oh, wow. So we call this virus Star Wars because it <laughs> happens outside of an infected cell. And for years, I was studying the molecules <coughs> that drive those Star Wars. And it turns out some of those molecules some of them are rabbit-specific, but some also work against elements of the human immune system. So if you're ever interested in that topic, uh, my wife, Alexandra Lucas, studies those molecules as drugs to inhibit the immune system when they cause certain kinds of disease. Her interest is in cardiovascular biology, so she's interested in molecules that treat uh, what's called systemic inflammation and diseases of the vasculature. Uh, but that's a t completely different story, and, and yeah. you can bring her in and talk to her about it sometime. <laughs> that that sounds super fascinating. So, like, what um, what does that allow you to do? Or like, it sounds like your research is trying to figure out how to utilize that mechanism for a different purpose. Is is that right? Is well, that a fair uh, way to characterize it? Initially, no. Uh, initially, it was just pure what we call a curiosity based research. Okay. I was curious what the virus made and what those molecules actually did to protect the virus from the immune system. So just pure uh, fundamental uh, 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 research uh, that uh, is funded by you know, uh, agencies like NIH and at the time in Canada by agencies like the CIHR uh, just to fund fundamental inquiries into biology. Okay. And as we started studying this, we learned that the molecules that the virus made actually is kind of like an encyclopedia of teaching us about what hosts do, how the immune system of the host mm. works. So we could identify a virus molecule, showed that it, it protected the virus from the immune system, and then use that molecule to find out what is it protecting against. So then that allowed us to ask questions about how does the immune system work? How does the immune system see a virus? How does the immune system come in and try to clear a virus? And why does that fail sometimes? which it clearly does in many viral infections, and COVID-19 is a classic example. So um, so th then what? Like, did that trigger some sort of, uh, you know, you went from curiosity to, wait a second, we can, we right. can utilize this for something else, right? right? So, uh, so what, the, the what very... What was that moment like? And, well, um, yeah. th it's happened a couple times. Okay. Uh, the first time happened with those molecules that I told you about, those anti-immune molecules that the virus uses as drugs. That's what led uh, to uh, my wife and I uh, uh, developing uh, those molecules uh, to use as drugs to treat systemic inflammation that drives heart disease and vascular diseases. So that's the story she can tell you all, all about. So the initial uh, eureka moment was kind of towards that. Okay. And that led to the formation of a biotech company in Canada 
uh, to try and develop clinical trials using those molecules to treat heart disease. So, um, but, uh, so that was the first Eureka moment, and, and that's kind of a, its own separate story, and that's the one that Alex could tell you the most about, okay. uh, because she's deeply involved, her own lab is deeply involved in that as a research project, and she's currently spinning off a biotech company here in Arizona to do exactly that, to treat not only vascular diseases, but also uh, the, 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 the lung inflammation associated with COVID and long COVID. Okay, very cool. So, so then there was a second Eureka right. moment. <laughs> right, so the second Eureka moment uh, happened uh, several years later as I was studying this, uh, the virus replication in cells that were not rabbit. And uh, we were studying it in human cells. And what we found is um, primary human cells, in other words, cells that are fresh out of a human, uh, defended themselves very well uh, uh, from the, the virus. And the virus really couldn't infect them. It tried, but it failed. It's, it, they, it caused what we call in the trade an abortive viral infection. Okay. So when that happened, uh, that was pretty fascinating. Um, but uh, we also noticed that there were certain human cells we had in the lab that the virus would infect and treated them like, um, like rabbit cells. And in other words, those cells could not defend themselves. And as we started studying it and looking into it, it turned out that the cells that were sensitive to the virus were cancer cells. Oh, wow. So that observation got us to thinking we have a virus that's completely safe in humans and in mice, uh, and yet when it's in a cancer cell, attacks those cells the same way it does rabbit cells in rabbits. So that got us to thinking, could we use this virus as a therapeutic against cancer? And that is what got me into the field of oncolytic virotherapy. And the field of oncolytic virotherapy has been around for decades. Uh, but it involves taking a live virus and using it to infect and kill cancer cells in a host that has cancer. In other words, to selectively infect and kill cancer cells, but leave the normal cells and tissues alone. So when you describe that, that seems so promising, right? Because the virus itself is harmless to humans, only kills cancer cells. Once all the can cancer cells are dead, the virus itself dies because it doesn't have a host, right? So like, it seems like a absolute miracle type of uh, thing. So what's, what's next? Or like, could, could that potentially ki uh, cure any kind of cancer? Or is that a specific type of cancer? Or... Um, what has your research shown so far? So um, you have to back up and kind of consider the field of oncolytic virotherapy. So um, the idea of using live viruses to kill, infect and kill can and eliminate cancer is over 100 years old. And it came from observations uh, at the turn of the last century in which some clinicians noticed that when their cancer patients got an infection of different kinds, sometimes their cancers would regress and completely vanish. And no one really understood what was going on. Uh, why was a viral infection associated with a cancer patient getting better? And so years went by and people tried to use different viruses uh, to treat cancer. And those at early days uh, attempts uh, were kind of iffy. In other words, the viruses they used could be dangerous and cause disease. So sometimes their recipients got the viral disease. Sometimes their cancers regressed and sometimes it didn't. Mm -hmm. And so the field kind of faded away until uh, what would I would call the modern era of molecular virology. Uh, and what that era is, is the ability to take specific viruses and genetically modify them in different ways right. to be able to study them. And that's what my lab had been doing, is, is taking this particular virus called myxoma virus and genetically altering it in different ways to study the virus, to try and understand what it is the virus did and how it did it. So um, with the modern era of being able to manipulate viruses, uh, the field of oncolytic virotherapy kind of went through a renaissance. Mm -hmm. And now different groups studying different viruses could genetically modify them to make them safer and to make them better cancer killers. 
And so uh, when I landed in the field, there were already m uh, numerous viruses that were in clinical trial that were being studied for different kinds of cancers. And since that time, uh, one virus has actually been approved uh, by the FDA and the European Union. It's a herpes virus, very related to the virus that causes cold sores, that has been manipulated to treat cancer, and it's now been approved for treatment of metastatic melanoma. Oh, wow. So one of the things that that licensure taught us is that treating cancer is not easy. Uh, it's not a trivial business. Uh, and in the early days, most of us thought that if we had a magic bullet virus that would go in and kill every last cancer cell, that could be a magical treatment for cancer. Right. But the reality has turned out it is not quite like that. That initial idea that your virus had to get in and infect and kill every last cancer cell turned out to be impractical. And mm. the reason it's impractical is because cancer doesn't play fair. Uh, not only uh, does it tend to uh, wander around, it sets up sites, metastatic sites in the body where you don't even know where it is. So you don't know how to get a virus to it. So in other words, delivery of the virus, the ther any therapeutic virus to the cancer is a big problem. Uh, and it is a big challenge that, that many of us are facing and it helps determine what kind of cancers could we treat and which ones probably uh, are just not going to be amenable to viral therapy. I see. That, that's interesting. So what is this one showing promise in? What kind of cancers? So we've studied it in the lab against many different cancers. And this is what, what you call academic research. So we've looked at cancers like multiple myeloma, uh, um, sarcomas, metastatic sarcomas in the lung, primary lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. But these are lab experiments using lab virus. In order to get into people, uh, that's a much bigger deal. Uh, you just can't take a virus out of a lab and inject it into a person and hope for the best. So, Do you sometimes wish you could? <laughs> some, well, you know, uh, I know how we work with an exceedingly safe virus, but at the same time, you have to respect the fact that the purpose of the FDA is to keep the public safe. Right. So any new therapy has to uh, pass high hurdles of safety, and you have to prove efficacy before the FDA is going to allow it for licensure. So um, th what, do you, what do you think of the FDA methods in terms of like slowing things like this down? Is that, I mean, there's some level of slowness that you want because you're talking about human lives, but then what about uh, cancer patients who, are, who only have months to live anyway? Like wouldn't, shouldn't some of the option be up to them to take experimental type of um, drugs that, that might be at early stages that haven't necessarily shown decades of uh, effectiveness? Well, remember that the purpose of the FDA is, is to ensure safety. Right. In other words, they, they are the safety protection net in, in this area for the public. Right. And so they take safety very seriously, and I totally get that. Uh, and and uh, the last thing we ever want to do is to put a product into people that might cause harm. Right. So uh, I totally uh, accept and buy into the standards that the FDA demand before you begin clinical trials. How, how long, like, okay, so you're uh, at a stage where um, there's, there's some promise being shown in lab type environments. How long before that actually gets put into people or tested in people? And then how long before it becomes sort of viable option, if, assuming all of the tests pass, what's like the best case scenario in terms of number of years that something like this would take? Well, that's a moving target. And, and part of the reason it's a moving target uh, is because over the years, there have been many clinical trials with many different oncolytic viruses. And during that time, the FDA has become more and more comfortable with them as new entities, as new drugs to be used uh, in cancer patients. And one of the upsides of the field is that oncolytic viruses have turned out to be exceedingly safe. Uh, in a broad spectrum of trials with many different viruses, their safety record is excellent. They so, might not cure the thing that they're shooting out to but kill. But they're not cure, causing harm. Okay. That, that. So, uh, but that's very important. Yeah. And so that has allowed greater and greater confidence uh, to by the track. FDA to, to allow, uh, I, I would say, accelerated programs to uh, prove safety and eventually prove efficacy for a new agent. But 
Even so, it takes time and money. And, and give give us a sense as to what is that time? Is that is that one year? Is that five years? What what could be like? Uh, what's a typical thing that goes through smooth sailing? Shows that it's safe and shows that it's effective. Like how long between um, the stage where uh, it shows results in the lab to where a prescription can be given out by by a doctor? So uh, take the example of the uh, the one licensed virus. It's called TVEC and it's marketed by Amgen. Okay. You look back at, at its history with the FDA, uh, what you see uh, is that, that the virus was actually being studied in academic settings for over a decade uh, before it even entered into the, the clinical trials uh, that it took to get to licensure. Right. So you could say that the gap for that first generation virus was closer to 15 to 20 years. A long time. But, but if you don't count the decade long in academic right. settings, because like if we were to say, for example, the you know, th- decades that you have been researching this particular uh, virus, it gets counted towards that. It would skew. Yes. It would Correct. skew it incorrectly. But, but from the moment where you're like, okay, this is showing promise in the lab in killing cancer cells, to where you're like, okay, let's get this thing moving to clinical trials or you know you know put it on the pathway to humans being able to use it what is what does that time frame look like so uh the example of tvec it would probably be about four to five years four to five years from when it began clinical trials to eventually hit licensure okay it might even be a little bit longer than that uh, i'd have to go back and kind of look at when the first initial trial was licensed it might be a little bit longer than that but the times have been shortening in part because the FDA is becoming more confident in the safety record of these viruses. And also, we're learning more and more, what exactly do you have to prove in trials before you get to licensure? What's the bar? And the bar varies from cancer type to cancer type. Uh, Some cancers have a higher bar uh, than others, in part because you have to also factor in what, what do standard treatments do for that cancer? Yeah. In other words, is there no hope for that cancer? Is it well treated? Is it in gotcha. between? So, so something uh, that has no hope would be more likely to get fast tracked versus something correct. that already has existing solutions that might be pretty good but not great. Correct. So, for example, on one end, you could consider multiple myeloma, in which there are a lot of new drugs now, uh, and those patients are living longer and longer all the time. Mm. The threshold to get a new therapy, like let's say a virus, into as a treatment against multiple myeloma is a higher bar, in part because the c- uh, current level of care and the new drugs coming down the market are pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and they still don't cure multiple myeloma, and myeloma patients are all very interested in long-time cures now. Uh, right. But- and uh, totally understandable, but the bar for licensure uh, is a little bit higher. On that the other sense. hand, late-stage pancreatic cancer uh, there's very little uh, that current medicine can do. And that's the cancer that kills you in less than six months type of thing, right? Yeah, there are a number of cancers still like that. Uh, brain cancers can be like that. Uh, there's a number of what we call intractable uh, cancers right now uh, that um, one of the top or one of the targets for not only the virus we're studying, uh, but uh, other viruses as well will be to some of those intractable cancers. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, that makes sense. Um, so uh, staying on this subject of FDA and approval of drugs, um, I, I want to shift the conversation a little bit towards COVID and the COVID-19 vaccine and how that was fast-tracked. Right. Can, can you like sort of educate me and, you know, like on w- what went on there and like what was different about the COVID-19 vaccine sort of trial process versus what's normal? Okay. So... Uh, that's an, actually a very good example uh, because when uh, SARS-CoV-2 landed in people, and it's hard to believe it was a year and a half ago, um, it was, uh, I wouldn't say totally unexpected because coronaviruses have leapt out of animal species and gotten into humans. Uh, there's at, at least four or five different current human coronaviruses that cause cold, and there's been uh, two other coronaviruses that cause serious a lethal disease in humans that emerged, uh, but never really spread around the world. Uh, whereas SARS-CoV-2 has managed to spread all around the world. Right. So it was like a thunderclap, uh, not only to uh, <coughs> public health, uh, but 
to uh, scientists and virologists in particular. And so many, many virologists, including myself, kind of dropped what they were doing and looked to see what, what can be done against uh, uh, COVID-19 in terms of drugs, in terms of vaccines, in terms of therapies, in terms of diagnostics. So what happened was that uh, when COVID-19 uh, started spreading around the world and everyone realized this would be a major uh, a public health issue, many different programs got mobilized very quickly, including the vaccine programs. Mm. So there were a number of, of platforms uh, that had been under investigation of different types, because there are different ways to make, for example, vaccines. Right. You can, uh, you can make, uh, you can adapt viruses. You can use live viruses and engineer them to immunize against uh, what we call antigens or epitopes on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that's the basis of the AstraZeneca and the J&J vaccines, for example. It's based on a live adenovirus vaccine. You can also... That's the more traditional vac vaccine. So is, that is, is that... a traditional vaccine. Okay. Another traditional vaccine is to take a virus and inactivate it and just uh, put use the dead virus as, as the immunogen, as the vaccine. Okay. That's also quite classical. Um, but in addition, there's new technologies that have, that have been uh, uh, developed. Um, and they're mostly based on uh, modern day molecular biology. So for example, there are some vaccines that are based on what we call subunits, little pieces of, of the virus that are strung together in little particles and they can function like an, a vaccine, like an immunogen. Uh, but the famous one, or, or now famous, is the so-called messenger RNA vaccines. Mm. Uh, that, that we're familiar with from Moderna uh, and, and Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer, for example. Um, the, techno the technology of using messenger RNA as a vaccine ha had actually been studied in the lab for almost 20 years. So it, it wasn't a new technology. It was actually well investigated. The people who developed those vaccines knew quite a bit about the platform. But when SARS-CoV-2 came along, no one knew what would happen when, if, if, when that technology was adapted to this coronavirus. No one really knew. Right. But it was fast-tracked. And uh, not only was its development fast-tracked, but the clinical trials to test it were fast-tracked, but in a very special way. So normally, uh, vaccines or new products are developed over what's called uh, a clinical trial development. So there's phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Right. Phase one, safety phase two, some efficacy, phase three showing that it is widespread efficacy uh, that is better than anything else out there. So those n uh, three phases normally happen only after what's called clinical grade manufacture of the drug happens, okay. which uh, uh, can be very expensive. And very often it is not really developed until later in the stage in the clinical trials because you don't want to spend millions or billions of dollars on something that never reaches licensure. Mm. So normally the process takes, you learn how to GMP manufacture it, then you go into clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then hopefully get to licensure. For vaccines, traditionally that has normally taken four, five, six years, uh, or even up to a decade. Right. So it normally takes a long period of time. And in part, it's because that's probably the most parsimonious way to do it. Right. But when COVID-19 arrived, the decision was made that we want to do this faster. And how could we do it? And one way to do that is to throw money at it, lots of money, and to say, we're going to take the top vaccine platforms and we're going to start the clinical grade manufacture of them. Right off even the bat. Right off the bat, even before they've passed through the different phase uh, clinical trials uh, before they've hit approval, even right. So, and uh, even if they fail, then we, we'll just chalk it up to a loss. Hopefully, one of the four or five work. That and, that's exactly. It was a gamble. Right. It, it was a bet. But given the seriousness of it, uh, clearly many people and many companies risked billions of dollars uh, uh, in those bets, and it turned out uh, that. The bet for the messenger RNAs and the adeno-based vectors are pretty darn good as well. Yeah, um, uh, turned out to be a good one, uh, a lucky one, and so not as money uh, as much money was lost taking the gamble as could have been lost. 
Okay. Every penny of it could have been lost if the gamble hadn't worked out. For sure. So let's talk about the uh, messenger RNA, which is um, commonly referred to as mRNA vaccines, right? Yes. Like, so uh, how how does the message in messenger RNA work? Yeah. So uh, it is a product of what we call modern day molecular biology. So uh, a messenger RNA is a form of nucleic acid that's in every cell in the body, and it's kind of the transient molecule that makes proteins. So in other words, the genes in our nucleus carry our genetic information. Yeah. But but in order to translate the genetic information into proteins, they you have to create a messenger, which in the body lasts only for a short period of time, minutes, hours, maybe days. And during that time, it makes the protein and then it goes away. So um, the idea was put forward uh, two decades ago that if we could make a vaccine based on a message, a messenger RNA, then it is the precursor to actually making the product, to actually making the protein that is the immunogen that provides the immunity against the disease. Mm -hmm. So before that, uh, vaccines had been based on what's called DNA. But DNA has to get into the cell, has to get into the nucleus. It has to make messenger RNA. That messenger RNA has to be translated into protein, and that becomes the vaccine. So the idea was we could speed things up by instead of making DNA-based vaccines, make them based on messenger RNA. And then we can tailor make the messenger RNA so that number one, it makes only what we want it to make, but it'll make it quickly. And then after it's made the product, it'll go away, it'll be degraded. So it's a transient but fast way to make something that you want to, for example, immunize against. Right. And the advantage of modern day molecular biology is once you know the sequence of the, the protein or the gene that makes the protein that you want to immunize against, it literally takes only a day or two to make the messenger RNA. And then the, the complicated part is how do you deliver it? And, and test it. And, and deliver it and test it and make sure that it actually works. Right. Uh, and. Uh, fortunately, when COVID-19 came along, the technology of messenger RNA vaccines or mRNA vaccines was fairly well established. And all they had to do was get the genetic sequence of, plug it of the SARS-CoV-2 and plug it in. So it's a plug and play vaccine. That, that's awesome. So like now, do you, do you feel like we're at a state, we just leveled up our vaccination capabilities in, in this sense that like now the next, um, the next time something like this happens, we can quickly develop a vaccine because now mRNA is proven. Um, the, all we need is the genetic sequence, plug it in, go through the testing phase, and, and boom, we have a new vaccine every... We have the potential to create new vaccines in now like 12 months type of time frame or instead of five years or... So uh, uh, that that is in fact the goal and the hope okay. uh, is that now <coughs> we've got a platform uh, where you can rapidly adapt to new pathogens as they as they come out. It's got an excellent safety record in humans, and it causes excellent vaccination, excellent immunity, at least in the case of SARS-CoV-2, uh, um, and perhaps for other pathogens as well, but you don't really know until you actually test them, until the rubber hits the road in people. Let's talk about the safety for a moment, because like, um, where do you, how, like, where do you get your confidence in terms of its safety when you know it's such a new thing that hasn't been around for in people for like more than a decade? The the thing that sort of concerns a lot of people, uh, people who like I hear, oh, I don't want to get a vaccine because nobody knows what's going to happen to these people ten years from now. Are they going to become infertile, or you know, is some other disease going to uh, you know you know pop up in them that uh, they I didn't anticipate. What is your like? Why are you not concerned about those types of things? Well, for any new technology, you have to be concerned about safety. Yeah. But fortunately, uh, there's a great deal we know about vaccine safety in general, because many many vaccines have been through you know the the regulatory process. Many have been approved. We know m essentially everyone on Earth has received one or more vaccines. We know a lot about how traditional vaccines behave in people. So we know what to look for. But but this one in particular, because it's mRNA and it's like the first time it's being used, like what, what is your confidence in the messenger RNA type of vaccine? Like where does that come from, that so, confidence of safety? So what we know uh, it, in terms of how it behaves is that the messenger RNA vaccine is designed so that 
the active ingredient, which is the messenger RNA, will vanish after a few days. In mm -hmm. other words, it's designed, it, it's kind of a kill switch internally where it dissolves, it is lost after a couple of days. So uh, in terms of long-term consequences of, of the actual vaccine, there was very little worries uh, uh, about it. Um, what the, the, the people pay attention to is what about consequences of vaccine vaccinations in people because you can do safety trials in animals but what really matters is what happens in people so people that have looked at vaccine safety so experts like Paul Offit and, and others say that when a vaccine causes problems in humans it inevitably does it within the first six weeks mm. in other words the history is if there's a problem with a vaccine you will know it within six weeks and the way the the clinical trials were done for these is tens of thousands of people were, were, uh, uh, were tested with the vaccine, then followed for months. Mm. So uh, those results were very, very uh, safe. The, the results were very clear. But again, until you're into millions of people, uh, a rare kind of complication may not pop out until you're actually in large numbers of people. And so far, the messenger RNA vaccines have had, had an excellent uh, a safety record with hundreds, for as, of millions. with hundreds of millions of people for up to a year now. Right. Uh, and uh, so by and large, when a vaccine causes no complications within that period of time, it never will. So our, my expectation is that the messenger RNA technology is here to stay and it's, it will be usable for other pathogens, including variants of SARS-CoV-2 that should arise now or in the future. That's awesome. That's so, so great to hear. So you have no concerns recommending the vaccine to anyone? No, I recommend it to everyone that I talk to. Uh, what about uh, kids? Like, uh, do, do you have any concern there? Or do you feel like the CDC's guidance that like, hey, they're, they're taking it level by level is pretty, uh, is pretty appropriate. And now I think they're uh, they've given the thumbs up for 12 and over, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So uh, the, the FDA, is be, like it, it should, is being very cautious and wants very solid data before it will allow licensure for kids of, of any age. So um, the, um, the messenger RNA vaccine, uh, uh, or one of them, has been approved for 12 to 16-year-olds. It went through a, a proper clinical trial. It had 100% efficacy. Uh, in other words, every single child from 12 to 16 who got this virus was protected from COVID-19. Uh, so, um, and w it, it was as safe in them as it is in adults. The next step, so I, I'm pretty sure uh, it will be followed by uh, licensure for 12 to 16 year olds. The next uh, 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 unknown is two year olds to 12 year olds. Gotcha. So those trials have begun. Uh, the expectation is that, the, it, or at least my expectation, is that the vaccine will do very well in that population, and eventually uh, we will be vaccinating kids down to the age of two. But, I, I, I mean, it's still the early days. Until the data is actually in, we can't say it for sure. But the trials are being done correctly. Right. Uh, and the data is very compelling so far. That, that This technology of vaccines, and everyone has been tested in, is very safe and works amazingly well. So um, you mentioned that the, the mRNA, the, the messenger, the, the delivery mechanism sort of like disappears or has a self-kill switch after a couple of days it goes away. Is that why most people experience side effects in only the first couple of days and then sort of like if they're going to have any kind of side effects, it's going to happen in the first couple of days and then it sort of disappears from there? Or? Yes. Uh, and and uh, one of the things I didn't talk about is that there's a trick they have to use with the messenger RNA to get it inside of cells. If you take just messenger RNA and inject it into people, it'll never get inside a cell. It'll just degrade, it'll never make the product. It won't function as a vaccine. So the trick that they use is they have to cover it in a lipid envelope. Uh, mm. uh, and some of the elements of those lipids, uh, some people are more sensitive to uh, than others. Uh, and the source of the uh, reaction, the, the pain that some people feel, the muscle ache and that, is probably related to those lipids uh, gotcha. that, that are used to get the messenger RNA into cells. Gotcha. Uh, but by and large, most people uh, regard uh, the, uh, the symptoms going away 
Uh, and uh, uh, I, I know when I got the messenger RNA vaccine, my arm really hurt the second day. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but the fact that it, it, it is hurting is actually emblematic that it's working. Because the pain comes from the immune response, the innate immune response to the vaccination. Mm. And it's telling you the immune system is waking up, it is seeing it, it is doing the right thing, and it's in the process of protecting you. So even though it's a drag to have the, those consequences, uh, the, the pain and the inflammation, the truth is it's your body telling you that the thing is working. So um, did you get the uh, Moderna one or Pfizer? I got the Pfizer. Pfizer, I, I did as well. So for people who have had COVID, right, like, is it necessary for them to even get the vaccine or does the vaccine provide similar protection to having had COVID? Yeah, that question gets asked a lot. Um, and uh, before we had a lot of data, it wasn't clear whether or not <coughs> having COVID and recovering from it is equivalent to, to getting the vaccine. We're getting more data now indicating that the vaccine, the vaccination is superior to getting the disease in terms of protecting for, from infection again. Uh, and part of the reason probably is the, the virus itself, when it gets in, um, probably manipulates the immune response itself. Very much like the example I told you of myxoma virus affecting the immune system of the infected host, SARS-CoV-2 uh, does the same. Right. And probably it is affecting the ability to make an acquired immune response to the virus. So as a consequence, people that recover from COVID vary all over the map. Some are protected, some are semi-protected, and some are not protected. Mm. In other words, it's very, very variable how protected a person is after recovering from COVID. In contrast, people that are vaccinated respond fairly uniformly, like 95% plus, to getting acquired protection against the disease. So the short answer is if you've had COVID and you've recovered from it and you don't want to get it again, uh, it is now recommended that you indeed get vaccinated. Gotcha, that makes sense. So, you know, obviously uh, all of the population of Earth went through a pretty um, crazy time for the past year and a half. Do you think one of the positive side effects of the past year and a half is going to be huge improvements in health and uh, medicine and biotech that's going to come out as a result of all the research that was that went into uh, trying to fight uh, uh, COVID? Or like, are we going to be back on the same sort of trajectory that we were on before uh, before all this hit? Yeah, so th that's a two-part question. Uh, one is about um, the psychology of people and also politics, right? <laughs> right, Because money for funding comes from both of those things, right? Uh, and they're not identical to each other. So I think a lot of people have been converted to the idea that, that vaccines against something new can work. Uh, not everyone is convinced, yeah. obviously. There, there's a great deal of... of, of, of Misinformation I, I and misinformation, disinformation, and pol for political games around something that should not be political at all. Right. We're talking about health and 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 medicine. We shouldn't be talking about politics at all. But uh, I would say uh, that the uh, the rate and, and the way the world health profession has responded with vaccines, and you can clearly see the effect in the U.S. The case loads are dropping. Many of us thought that it would take 70 to 80 percent of the population to be vaccinated before we saw a huge reduction in disease burden. And yet we're uh, barely at 50 percent. And yet the case loads are dropping considerably. So right. in some ways, I think all of that should convince even a skeptic that there's something positive here that we should pay attention to. And perhaps we should be better prepared for the next pandemic that uh, we won't predict any better than we predicted SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19. Uh, we should invest in new technologies and medical re fundamental research and in our health infrastructure. What, what, what do you think about like uh, the, the notion that aging is also like part of the problem in uh, medicine and we don't like view aging as a disease and therefore we're missing an opportunity to really cure like 
diseases in general because we don't categorize aging as a disease, right? So, and, and it, even if you look at COVID, the vast majority of people who are most severely affected are, you, you know, the elderly. The older you are, the more severely you're, you're affected. And it's sort of like an exponential curve that, you know, people over 70 or 80, 90 certainly have like a much higher, by, by as much as 100 times, 500 times more than somebody who's 20. Um, so do you, do you see us maybe, or maybe even COVID being a catalyst for us to look at aging as a disease as opposed to just a natural part of living? Well, uh, one of the unknowns when COVID arrived, uh, and it was clear that it was the elderly who were susceptible to death, uh, to severe disease and death. Uh, when that w was uh, um, observed, it wasn't clear whether or not any vaccine platform was g would do well against that population. Right. Because by and large, as people age, it gets harder and harder to immunize them against new things. And yet, what we've learned is uh, the, the modern vaccines have worked very well in that population, yeah. much better than we could have predicted. So I think all of that positive results uh, should convince people, should convince skeptics that paying attention to the science and technology can help the elderly, can help the aged. The more we learn about, for example, how the immune system actually works as we age, is hugely invaluable. We learn tons of things about our own health and also how to protect ourselves. In the let's put the vaccines and stuff aside for a moment. In the research that you've done, is there anything that like shows or has helped you realize that aging might be a reversible thing, right? Like th this is a, a, an interest that of many, uh, right? Uh, and um, uh, it seems like the group that or the scientists who are studying aging in particular and trying to figure out how to reverse it are not necessarily well as well respected in the scientific community in the medicine medical community as those who are studying cancer or various different other um, diseases so i'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on that and is, is that a worth worthy goal for us to be trying to figure out you, you know, how do we like reverse the clock, if you will? Well, as I look at it, uh, um, simple numbers will tell you that we're living longer now compared to 100 years ago. Like in our For grandparents sure. and our great grandparents era, it was uh, common to die what we would call early uh, and um, not be as healthy as we are today uh, when they died. Um, so it, it, it's but, clear. But the boundaries don't seem to have moved even from 100 right. years ago, right? Like meaning, uh, you, you know, like the upper limits were around 100 years. Um, and even now the upper limits are around 100 years. Nothing has changed there. Like that hasn't doubled despite the average person's life expectancy doubling. Yeah. So I, I'm one of those people who believes that there probably is a biologic upper limit. Uh, and I'm not sure what it is. But... Uh, in terms of the length of time you can live. Right. Uh, but what I'm kind of more interested in is how do we live well uh, for the, uh, the most amount of time. For sure. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, my grandfather uh, died of old age at 65. Uh, and um, it was very normal back then right. uh, at that time. Now, uh, 65, uh, and I... I, I think many of us would agree, uh, ain't old yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, th there are many, many good years uh, ahead. And how do we maximize that? Right. And uh, there are clearly many things that we've learned already. So health from infectious disease, health in general, attacking uh, chronic diseases, uh, uh, cr uh, tackling diseases of age like cancer are all worthwhile. But there's also things we can do to our lives uh, in terms of health, uh, in terms of general well-being, psychological and physical, that really matter, that really determine uh, uh, how long and how well we're going to, to live. But there's also things to be discovered. The one thing that science has taught me is uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. There are things we're going to learn in the future. There, there are insights to be made that are going to bear on that question in ways that we can't imagine right now. That's why I love science, is because we can't predict it all, but I know some of what's going to be learned is going to be mind-blowing. Yeah. 
If you were to advise, and I'm sure you, you know, you're uh, as a professor, you're you're talking to um, you know up and coming graduates in in college or uh, college students. What do you advise them? Like, what what is the field for them to go into that would be something that could potentially move the needle uh, within the biotech s uh, sphere, if you will? Well, uh, um, as as the old saying goes. Uh, Predictions are difficult, uh, uh, especially when they're about the future. <laughs> um, so uh, the truth is we don't know where the next magical discoveries are going to be. Uh, everyone is a little bit different in terms of what let me Let me put them. the question a different way. If you were 20 years old today, what would you be studying uh, based on what you know now? Oh, I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that the golden age of biology, in other words, studying in different aspects of it, uh, right up to biotechnology, are uh, just beginning the golden, their golden age. Um, but on the other hand, when I, when I was a kid, I was very fascinated with cosmology hmm. uh, and uh, high energy particle physics. And that area looks to me like absolutely fascinating. I, I don't understand it yeah. kind of the way I do biology and viruses, but I'm still fascinated by it. And I would have no trouble uh, um, uh, communicating to a young person, if you find this fascinating, go into it. Because science has a way of developing in, in fashions that we don't understand. Yeah. In, in other words, that we can't predict. So if you are fascinated by something, uh, I was given the advice, when I was a graduate student, and an old chairman uh, who was getting ready to retire pulled me aside to give me some advice. And uh, he said, uh, his advice is find something that really fascinates you and become the world authority in it, and don't worry about anything else. Yeah. And I kind of my career kind of followed that. And, and how how crazy is it that this thing that fascinated you about the rabbit virus could turn out to be something that helps cure cancer, <laughs> right? Like, well, it, it is it, it is great advice. Become an expert. Like, see everything or like see a particular thing from every possible angle so that you can see everything that's there. And in this particular case, it might actually lead to something great. Yeah, so again, this is something where it's still the early days. So in order to get into clinical trials with this virus, uh, we've started a new I, biotech company. I, I, I love your uh, conservativeness. Uh, you know, every time I say it could potentially cure cancer, you're like trying to <laughs> die down the, uh, the expectations. Um, no, that, that's awesome. Um, let, let me ask you, uh, move on to ASU for a moment. Uh, ASU is doing some like pretty amazing stuff. Uh, what are you most excited about at ASU and ASU research that, uh, that, that's being done? Well, uh, I'm at the Biodesign Institute, uh, and one of its uh, goals is to uh, foster uh, um, tra what's called translational research. In other words, research that leads to something uh, um, of use. And... The way they do that is to encourage interdisciplinary research. So in the past, in universities that I've been at, and ASU is my fourth and my, the last stop for my academic career, um, the, the disciplines are always divided into de departments. So a department of biochemistry or department of microbiology or whatever, or a cancer biology group. And they tended to act in kind of self-contained entities. Um, Biodesign and ASU uh, are kind of unique in that they really encourage breaking down those barriers. In other words, getting engineers to talk to biologists and getting mm -hmm. virologists to talk to people that, that are developing diagnostics and things like that. So the building is designed for people in different disciplines to bump into each other, to interact, and to collaborate. And I kind of like that. Uh, I, I think it, it's very unique. Uh, many academic places don't operate like that. And I think it's a real advantage that ASU has. That, that is really great to hear. I didn't hear you say software in there. Like, are there software developers who are, um, is there software engineering aspects in, in the? There certainly are. Uh, it, it just, uh, um, that field is so far from my own. I, I have trouble even understanding when they talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is that the mRNA vac vaccine technology is oftentimes compared to coding. Right, because you know you can sort of like uh, code what this uh, this delivery mechanism is supposed to do and where to do it, and um, and that fascinates me. That like, hey, if we can get some software people in 
talking with some of the biotech people that the the progress might be um, the the multidisciplinary aspects of it might might actually allow us to make more progress than we would otherwise. Well, in fact, there is a great deal of, of software work and what's called computational biology that happens at at ASU, and they have some genuine experts in that area. But a, a simple way of thinking of it is that genes are kind of like hardware, and messenger RNA is like software. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, messenger RNA is like software, so yep. we we got to have software discipline in there yep. somewhere. As a software guy, I'm I'm just you know like putting in my boat there. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I would agree with that. In fact, uh, the origins of the genetic code, the way it was discovered, it was discovered by physicists and mathematicians looking at the principles involved. Yeah, very cool. What else are you excited about that uh, that you want to talk about? Well, uh, the final thing uh, is the biotech company um, that that uh, we've spun off at ASU. Uh, yeah, that's right. We should we should definitely talk about that. That's the one that is um, on track to do all of the research and clinical studies on on this uh, rabbit uh, virus that we're talking about, right? Right. So one of the things that that I I think was obvious is that there's limits to what an academic lab can do in terms of bringing something to into patients. Right. Uh, number one uh, is it takes an enormous amount of money and uh, a time and dedication. And um, so to really do it, you have to have corporate partners in some fashion. So when I moved to uh, ASU in 2016, one of the things I decided was to try and set up a new biotechnology company whose job it will be only to bring this virus into clinical trials uh, and to see if it actually works in real human cancer patients. So that led to the formation of Oncomix. Uh, and uh, we have a CEO, Steve Potts, who's here in Arizona and who's very devoted to developing biotechnology here in Arizona. Uh, we have, uh, we just moved into the Wexford building in downtown uh, Phoenix, uh, which w I think is going to be a biotech hub for Arizona in the coming years. Nice. Um, and the job of the company is to uh, identify, uh, arm uh, the virus, and uh, bring it forth into clinical trials in cancer patients. So this requires time, it requires investors, uh, and requires a great deal of dedication. I'm really proud of the company, and I can't wait to see what happens when the clinical trials begin, but it's not something my own lab could have done. And uh, Oncomix, uh, how's it being funded right now? So it was initially funded uh, two years ago in what's called a Series A uh, a financing. Okay. Uh, and um, um, we're right in the middle of what's called Series B financing right now. Uh, we hope to announce something in the next couple of months. Very uh, cool. But you need to acquire investors to come in, look at the program, and decide it's worth their money to put in as an investment for the long haul. And this is the type of thing that requires, what, 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 do, what do you expect in terms of investments uh, to, to get it to a good result, to, to where the, the drug gets approved by the FDA? And you mean in terms of time or money? Money. So uh, the, our Series A investment was $25 million, and uh, that uh, uh, got us through to uh, what we call an IND filing, in other words, a filing to the FDA of what we want to do for the cl clinical trial. Um, the Series B will be enough money to get us into clinical trials. In other words, to see at the early stage, how is this virus doing in different kinds of cancer patients? So how much that will be uh, uh, will, it will be determined by the trial raise, which is right. undergoing right now. But you can sort of guess that it, it's not pennies. Right, it's, not, uh, it's more than 25 million, yes. right? And, and then there might even be another stage where you then like take it to market the, the company and build the sales team and all that. And, and this is what, fr like it's a little bit frustrating as a software uh, entrepreneur about uh, the biotech sector that it requires such incredible sums of money to do something, right? Like a software person and their laptop can create something that changes the world uh, from anywhere in the world. But in the uh, biomedical field, uh, biotech field, you have to have literally $100 million in order to <laughs> potential, have the potential of changing the world. And um, 
What are your thoughts about that? Is there, is there, is that why so many people just do the research aspect of it and never build companies around uh, around this stuff? Well, uh, uh, it's a bit of a complicated question because those of us in academics, uh, we're generally involved in research and fundamental uh, inquiries, whereas companies are very specific. They're very focused on a, an end game. Right. In this case uh, of Oncomix, the end game is the clinical trials with uh, armed versions of, of the virus. So um, th th those are two different worlds. Uh, some people can uh, sort of hop uh, between them. It's not trivial. Uh, in academics, we're generally not taught anything about biotechnology or intellectual property or patents or fundraising or how you actually work a company. Um, it, 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 it tends to be... Um, um, people that are specialized in that who are better at it. It's like anything else. Right. People who are good at something uh, tend to be better than those uh, who are novices at it. So one of the things I've learned is um, just being a part of an academic lab doesn't mean you know how to set up a biotech company and how to make that company successful. So to do that, what I've learned is you have to bring in people who are really good at that. Yeah. So our CEO and our CSO uh, and our COO are all experts in, in their domains. So it's actually a pleasure to be around them. But they bring skills that I simply don't have. I, I'm excited about Oncomex. So, so, you know, don't get me wrong. But I just wish there was, you know, 100 Oncomexes being cre cre uh, created every year as opposed to one, <laughs> right? Like... Uh, yeah, I, I just don't know that many of them that are that are being that that are being made because of the enormous amounts of money that that's needed. Yeah, it's enormous amounts of money, and 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 the truth is, uh, biotechnology is hard. It's easier to be a failure than it is to be a success in right. biotech startups. I mean, that's true in every startup, right? Like, right. The, the the difference is that they don't necessarily need as much money. Is that it, so? You can do a lot more experiments for relatively low low cost in software. Yeah, so part of the... and, 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 you know, what worries me is that there's, you know, as as a, uh, like, the trend, world trend is towards software as opposed to some of these other things that we need. And it's like, how do you solve this problem, right? Like, and is, um, is all of the steps that we have to jump through necessary or, you know, from a safety standpoint, or is it slowing things down to where it's now not as safe because we don't have the progress that we should be having um, because of the amount of red tape that someone has to go through in order to get clinical things, um, clinical testing started. Well, one of the things you have to remember is certainly in the biologic therapy realm, in other words, developing drugs uh, for people that have got disease, is that uh, the consequence of failure may be worse than just doesn't work. Right. In other words, there's the potential to do harm yeah. if you don't do it right. Uh, and if you don't take all the stringencies for safety. And that's why the FDA is there. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely sure appreciate it. I, I'm not saying we should get rid of the <laughs> FDA by any means, but um, but I wonder if there's, there's a balance that uh, might be slightly better than the way it is today. Well, you know, if, I'll give you an example with, with respect to aviation, right? Like mm -hmm. um, uh, the aviation industry made incredible progress in the 60s and 70s uh, to, the, to the, and then like all of the, Airplane crashes uh, caused more and more regulations to be put into place to the point where all of the aviation companies that were creating planes basically shut down by the 80s. And, um, and then, you, you know, there weren't any more uh, small aircraft companies uh, between the 80s and today. Like, there's very, very few. Uh, Cessna, for example, is like one of the very few. And Literally, they're selling the exact same thing they were selling from the 60s to this day. Like the 182 design is like one of their uh, main models looks nearly identical to what they had uh, in the 1960s. And it has barely improved. The avionics have improved the software. But the, um, the progress was like only in this short period of time when there wasn't as much regulation put in place. But then once people did crash and die, there was, there was so much regulation put into place that the vast majority of people just literally exited the business and we still have we got stuck with the designs that we had in the 60s and 70s and you know a lot of that has happened in aviation in general even commercial airplanes the 747 which is one of the sort of like top 
uh, modern airplanes was created in, between 1965 and 1969. It made its her first flight. Nothing existed in 1965. So in a very short period of time, they went from nothing to their first flight. And then today, A, we only still have the 747 as the most modern Boeing aircraft. And, <laughs> you know, like this is 50 years later. Uh, and B, when they want to make a new version of the 747, that project is a 15-year project, which is mind-blowing. Yeah, so there's an old saying that nothing succeeds like success. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the example for, uh, just take, for example, the messenger RNA vaccines. Yes. Um, you can be pretty much guaranteed that the next generation of messenger RNA-based vaccines are going to be cheaper and, and will be approved faster. Yes. In part because what we've learned uh, can be successful. It took a global pandemic for us it to accelerate a, things a little bit, right? It, like it, it's, it, it took that. <laughs> it but shouldn't take that. It may be not, but uh, 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 that's what it took. But the end result is that it will be cheaper and faster uh, to use that technology in the future. Yeah. And, and I think that's also going to be true for my beloved passion for viral therapy. Well, Dr. McFadden, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you about this stuff. Thank you for taking the time to come and chat with me and entertain my crazy ideas and <laughs> tell us about your research. Uh, and, and I'm going to say cancer curing research that you're working on. Um, and I know you're going to ta <laughs> taper down the expectations there, but uh, I really appreciate it. But thanks a lot. It's been a gas. Awesome. All right, you made it to the end of the episode. I would love to get your feedback, so take a moment to leave a genuine review in your favorite podcast app. That also helps us reach more people. Speaking of reach, if you like a particular episode, be sure to share it with someone who you think would enjoy it. See you next time. The new world. The new world. Yeah, I love it. Okay. That, was, that was great. So is that what you wanted? Yes. <laughs> Good. Good. That's exactly what I wanted. Good.